It is so good to be back with you. Uh, We, as a family, spent nearly all of 2021 as a part of this church, and uh, I was thinking about the fact that though we've been supported by Jefferson Park for almost 15 years, uh, that year made this uh, home in many ways. So when I'm driving in and I see Wayside Chicken, I I feel good inside. Uh, when I go to the Parr House and drive down McElroy, uh, I remember the blizzard that knocked out our power. Uh, when I see the playground out back, I think about conversations that I had with, with people who live in this community. Uh, and then to be with you guys on Sunday morning, uh, just such a blessing. This, this feels in many ways like home. Uh, so really grateful to be with you I want to think with you about this idea of a refuge this morning. We think about refuge in different ways in life. I think for many of us, our home is our refuge, right? The place where you live, your house. Uh, For some of you, it might be a dorm room. Maybe it's a room in a house that you share with other people. Uh, We try to furnish it and and arrange it in ways that make us feel comfortable. It's a place for us to relax. If you're a young person, maybe your toys are there in your room. Maybe your books if you're a reader. So if you have a tough day, maybe feeling harassed and harried or overly busy at work or in school, you get back to your spot and you can unwind. Maybe if you're a parent of little ones, you you have some place to hide from your children in your house that is your place of refuge. I read uh, about a a mother of 12 some 100 years ago. Her, Her strategy would be to pull her cooking apron over her head as a signal to her children that she did not want to be bothered. I was thinking in the modern age, and we only have six, but it's noise canceling headphones for us a place of refuge. Sometimes it's not a place, but an activity. That's a refuge. Maybe exercising or playing a favorite sport. So you you play soccer or you play ultimate frisbee. and, And instead of feeling anxious, you let out all of your nervous energy in that exercise. Maybe it's music or some art form for you. But refuge is also an idea that we can use in more serious situations. So in a hurricane, ships take refuge in a harbor. Tornado, people go into a storm shelter. In wartime, refugees are people who flee from one place to try to survive in another. We are reading about that regularly in places like Ukraine or or in Gaza. Corey Ten Boom tells the story about the literal place of refuge that her family built in her bedroom to hide Jews who were fleeing the Holocaust during World War II. Her family uh, ran a, a watch repair shop in Holland, and as the hunt went on for Jews there, they, they got together some old wood and bricks, and they, they built a, a little secret room inside her bedroom. It was just a a few feet wide and six feet long, and six people could could crawl in through a a little panel that is removed down low, and and they could stand up just right in a row. Uh, That family helped more than 800 people fleeing the Gestapo. A number of times, the the police would come and search the whole house, including being mere feet from these, these hiding people and not find them. Her famous memoir is called The Hiding Place, The Refuge. I want us to think this morning about where you and I take refuge in the storms of life, the times of struggle, weariness, fear. Where is your place of security? Mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Where is your hiding place? I want to do that by looking at Psalm 16 together. It's a prayer of David to the Lord. And in it, he says that making God his refuge gave him a secure joy. What does that mean? How do we do that? And why should we do that? 
Important questions for us to consider whether you're in a time of difficulty right now or whether one is around the corner. So let's consider that big idea. Making God your refuge gives you a secure joy. We've read Psalm 16, a couple of observations about the big picture, and then I'll give you an outline. Uh, The whole prayer here is just four words. Preserve me, O God. That's David's prayer. What's going on for David to pray for preservation? Well, we don't really know. It's some kind of difficulty. You scan through the psalm, you can see down in verse 7, something's keeping him up at night. He needs God's instruction to guide his thoughts. He speaks about not being shaken. So this is some kind of trial. So preserve me, O God, is the prayer. For in you I take refuge is the ground. It's the reason, he says, God must help him. God, you've got to help me. Protect me because I've come to you for refuge. It's a really simple and profound prayer. God, you've got to help me because I've come to you for help. You pray this way if you believe God keeps his promises. You can go to God and say, look, you've promised to preserve me, to help me, to be with me. Well, I need help. So I'm here to take refuge in you. Now, in many ways, this could have been the shortest psalm in the Psalter. He could have stopped right there because that's his prayer. But what about the rest? Well, this idea of taking refuge in God is somewhat abstract, isn't it? He wants to flesh it out for himself and for us. How do you take refuge in God? What does that even mean? That's what 2 to 11 unpacks for us. And I want us to look at it in five steps or or five building blocks, if you like. How do you take refuge in God? You may want to write these things down so you can talk about them later over lunch. If making God your refuge gives you a secure joy, well, how do I do that? Five things. Number one, make him your Lord. Make him your Lord. Number two, delight in his people. Delight in his people. Number three, rest in his providence. Rest in his providence. Number four, receive his instruction. Receive his instruction. And then finally, number five, rejoice in his resurrection. Rejoice in his resurrection. So let's dive in there, number one, and think about make him your Lord in the first two verses. Let me read them again. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. So how does David make God his refuge? Well, interesting that it begins with something he says to the Lord. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. If you're new to the Bible, this language of Lord in all capitals and then Lord with just a capital L might be confusing. These are different Hebrew words for God. So Lord, all capitals, is Yahweh. It literally means I am that I am. It's the name by which God revealed himself to the people of Israel and entered a covenant with them. So for an Israelite, Yahweh is God's name. But that second Lord there is Adonai. It just means what the English word Lord means. You are my Lord. You're in charge. You're the master. I'm the servant. He says to Yahweh, you are my Lord. You know, we're often in position where where we need to tell other people that we're a Christian. Uh, It's a great thing to get used to doing, to look for opportunities to say, I'm a Christian. Early on when you meet someone, you you know, the strategy of waiting to to say it later doesn't work very well. You know, if someone's going to know you for a length of time and then you say, oh, by the way, the most important thing about me is that I'm a Christian. Well, what do you should have told me six months ago. It's good to know. So, so run that flag up early. Do it in school. Do it on your sports teams, in the office, on your social media profile. It's good to do. But it doesn't mean as much as what David is saying here. Why? Well, 
When a person says, I'm a Christian, to other people, that they can't see your heart. So that could be really meaningful, or it could be just that you're a nominal Christian, and an in-name only Christian. But when a person says this to the Lord, when in the privacy of their bedroom they get down to pray, nobody's looking, nobody's there, and they do business with God, that's different. When you say and you mean, you are my Lord, well, that means something much more significant. You're telling the all-seeing one that you intend to live as his obedient servant. Now, we might wonder, how does David view this lordship and servant relationship? Is this a difficult thing for him? I mean, is this like employment to a a company you can't wait to get out of? No, he says, I have no good apart from you. Literally, apart from you, I have no good thing. That's a staggering statement. I mean, David, what do you mean? No good apart from God. What about your family? Your kids? What about Solomon? What about your friends? What about Jonathan? Your best friend? What about your work as a king? Your rule of the people? These are all good things, aren't they? Well, I think David means that any other good things are caught up in and defined by God. And so when he sees these other things, he sees them through the lens of God. Those things only have meaning insofar as they are God's gift or God's calling for him. He he doesn't just mean that he puts God first. He means that, but he means that God is everything for him. I want us to see clearly that you cannot begin anywhere else if you're going to make God your refuge. If he's not everything to you, it's pointless to talk about him as a refuge. Because if he isn't your Lord in that sense, then he's just one option among many. Maybe he's a a place of last resort. You have your own ways of coping with life. You know, work harder with your own wisdom and strength. Amuse yourself with entertainment. Medicate yourself with alcohol or some other addiction. And then if all else fails, then I turn to him. That's not going to work. So how do we take refuge in God? We have to begin here. We first make him our Lord. But let's see a second thing that we need to do. Delight in his people. Verses 3 and 4. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God will multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. Now, David makes a contrast here between the saints, meaning the the people who live with God as their Lord, and the others who he sees are are running after other gods. He, He mentions here their drink offerings of blood. Many of the ancient gods of the Middle East had had rituals involving the the drinking of blood. But what's interesting is he's not referring to people of other religions that are doing this, I don't think people of the nations. Rather, he sees people in Israel who are mixing the true worship of Yahweh with running after other gods as well. And what does he say here? He says that mixed strategy produces nothing but multiplying sorrows. So picture the person who says, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, but is seldom in church because truth be told, their their career is number one. So, so they'll, they'll be here if it fits in with what's going on in their career. We have many people like that in Shanghai. A picture of the person who says they love God, but, but their love life is, is off limits to him. I'm a Christian, they're, they're saying, but, but I define it my own way. Because I want to chase the things I think will get me what I want. Well, well friends, see it clearly here. That's a pathway to multiplying sorrows. That's what verse 4 says, and sadly many go down that path. What we want to see is that right after David has said he makes Yahweh his Lord, he says he makes Yahweh's people his delight. Like they're inextricably linked, aren't they? I love God, 
so I love his people. Watch me love God's people, and you'll see that I love God. In our day, it's surprising how many people think they can love God without loving the church. It has to be somehow connected with the consumerism of the age in which we live. I've watched the last 25 years how consumerism has come from the West to the East. We moved back to China a few months ago, and I couldn't believe it, but Sam's Club has taken over Shanghai and the delivery of groceries. Uh, I wouldn't have predicted it. Why? Well, they will deliver your groceries to your door within 45 minutes of, of paying for it on the app. It's cheap, it's fast, it's good. So I, we dropped our other grocery store habits, like a bad habit. I mean, we just, we just dropped all the others. We're Sam's Club people now. <laughs> because when it comes to buying groceries, it's all about me. It's about my needs. It's about my money. And that attitude is totally fine with groceries. But think about how that kind of an attitude easily seeps over into our spiritual life. I mean, how about the person who, who shows up occasionally and is really happy that people set this whole thing up this morning? Really happy that other people were, were preparing this and have it all set up so I can come in when I want to come in and enjoy it. Isn't that consumerism? The same kind of thing? Think about the person who moves from church to church based on what seems new, cool, hot. That person may not even realize that they've begun viewing the church as primarily about them. Think about the person who makes sure to let people know when their preferences are not being met in the church. Think about that person who serves only when they feel platformed in their area of giftedness. Friends, that kind of thinking is the sign of a spiritual disease. It's the disease of self running through my blood, a cancer fatal to our souls. Church is meant as a place to serve before it's a place to be served because we follow a savior who showed up that way. And in God's mysterious plan, the, the way we often get encouraged, built up, find joy, is by serving someone else. I think it's invariably true that when Megan and I have left a church to, to move to a new place, and we look back, some of the people who encouraged us the most are the people that we never would have chosen to be friends with otherwise. They weren't, they weren't the people that we clicked with the easiest. They were the people who we were able to serve in some way, and then they served us back. And in the surprising and mysterious grace of God, they were the most encouraging to us. So let's ask ourselves this morning, do we delight in God's people? I don't mean because they're always delightful. I mean, do you delight in them because you delight in him? Friends, you should. You should. How do you make God your refuge? Make him your Lord. Delight in his people. Number three, rest in his providence. Verses five and six. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. David's already told us that he has no good apart from God. Here he, he brings that specifically into his life circumstances. So this language of portion and lot and, and lines seems to all be pointing to the partition of the land of Canaan, the promised land. So Israelite families were, were given land according to their tribe. This was their livelihood as they would have farmed it. It was the main source of their wealth. He calls it here his inheritance. So, so more broadly, this refers to our possessions, what we have. The image of a cup, he also mentions, in the Bible, the cup is an image often used of our circumstances, the blessings or disasters that come to a person. So 
They are what he or she has to drink. So sometimes we read about a cup of salvation or a cup of wrath. Or Psalm 23 can say, my cup overflows, talking about good circumstances. So, so my portion and my cup together points to our possessions and our circumstances. But question here, what does he mean by saying Yahweh is my portion and my cup? That means more than just he gives me my portion and my cup, right? I mean, we can see that too. That's implied when he says, you hold my lot and the lines have fallen for me. Uh, That points to God's providential ordering of our lives. You and I are where we are because of his meticulous sovereignty. But he is my portion and cup says something more. I think the idea is this. When, When God is your treasure then the amount of money in your bank account is incidental. Doesn't matter if you have $100 or $100,000. That's not your treasure. God's your treasure. All right? Um, When seeing God is your hope and your future, then the unfolding of the events of your career are secondary. You might get a promotion, you might not. But that's not your hope and your future. God is. And to live this way, you and I are going to have to fill in the details here. God is my high school diploma. God is my college degree. Whatever sort of paper you're working towards. God is my trophy at the end of the season. God is my resume. He's my portfolio. God is my reputation. We can summarize by by saying God is my all in all. But you've got to make it specific for you. And don't miss those adjectives that he adds. The lines have fallen in pleasant places. Surely I have a beautiful inheritance. This is where we're we're mighty curious if he wrote this in in hard times or good times. I mean, is he sitting on the the veranda of the palace and his kids are are playing there and he's enjoying a cup of tea? Or, Or is David running from Absalom and he's in a cave and he's reflecting on his failures as a king and a father and yet he's still deciding to trust God? We don't know. And maybe it's just as well we don't, because this this truth right here is central to our contentment, isn't it? You and I should practice saying, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places in all kinds of life situations. We should say it when we're sick and when we're healthy. We should say it when we've had a financial reversal and things are looking doubtful, as well as when we feel like we have plenty. We should say it when we're lonely and when we're full of friends. But friends, we can only do that if we locate our treasure in God. Because when you do that, your evaluation of how your life is going, it's not tied to your current ups and downs. You're able to rest in his providence. It's the third essential thing to make God your refuge. Number four. How do we make God our refuge? We receive his instruction, verses 7 and 8. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. David is blessing God or praising him for giving him counsel. Uh, As he looks at the specific challenges he's facing, he needs wisdom from God. God gives it. Uh, That phrase there, in the night also my heart instructs me, uh, could be lifted out of context. He's he's not saying that he looks inside of him for his truth and lets his heart tell him what what is true. Uh, In Hebrew poetry, things are written in parallel with, with one line repeating and amplifying being amplified by the next. So my heart instructs me is in parallel with the Lord gives me counsel. 
We should think back to Psalm 1 and David's pattern of meditating on God's word day and night. That's the idea here. As David has stored up God's counsel and instruction during the day, as he lays down at night, he's still thinking on it. He's trying to apply the truth to what has happened today and what he'll face tomorrow. So his heart instructs him. You know, I often reflect on the fact that nearly everything I needed to know about walking with God, I learned in my first year as a Christian. It's like the, the, the genius bookseller who in, entitled his book, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Uh, same, same kind of thing here. I was 19 years old. Eric Fleshhood gave me a Bible and said I should try to read some chapters every day, and then I should think about them and pray about them. I think that's basically what he said. Read some chapters, some chapters. How many? I don't know. Every day, read some chapters. Have you been taught to do that? Do do you do that? Maybe you, you learned that many, many years ago. You still doing that today? If God's word is food to the Christian... Jesus said, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, when do you eat? I'm sure glad we can have a a weekly family meal like this one. Don't, Don't miss that. But I think we should eat every day this coming week. Why don't we eat every day? I assume you plan to do that. Some of you are thinking about lunch right now. I think we should go ahead and plan to eat every day. We want to take in God's word in the day so we can meditate on it at night. I've heard some people tell me that they've stopped having regular devotion times because uh, their Bible reading plan began to feel legalistic to them. I mean, like like if if they missed a time of reading, they felt like maybe God doesn't love me. Uh, But if they're doing really well, they they, they kind of they're struggling with legalism in that sense. So their plan to deal with that was just to stop. I don't think that's a good plan. I think you should definitely address legalism in your life and remember that our sole basis of knowing we're loved by God is Jesus Christ. And then I think we should also make a plan to read God's word. The church I was at in Singapore, I talked with a man who uh, teaches at the National University of Singapore, uh, and he studies sleep patterns in the human brain Uh, his whole career. Uh, He spoke with me about what they call revenge bedtime procrastination. Have you heard about this? It's a modern phenomenon uh, of people who are already running a sleep deficit. Uh, Instead of going to sleep at night, they they stay up uh, watching videos and and scrolling through their phones. And and, and the, the theory is because in the modern age, more and more and more of our time is taken up by an employer or by other people. You know, you don't come home at five or six o'clock and lay things down. You can be working late into the evening. That that people are feeling like they need some me time. So they're sleep deprived, but but they're they're doing revenge bedtime procrastination. Brothers and sisters, how we end our day matters as much as how we start it. As you lay your head on the pillow, we we, we see David here. Don't take your phone with you. Put your charging station outside of your bedroom. That that would be a huge help to you. Instead, think back on the blessings of the day and thank God for them. If you realize that you've sinned, confess that to God and ask him for forgiveness. Maybe entrust to him the burdens of the morning. And close your day in prayer. Let your heart instruct you on the things that are true. For David, this habit of day and night meditation on God is summarized in verse 8 as, I've set the Lord always before me. So it's an intentional, consistent habit of the heart to think on God and choose to live for him. David says this makes him very confident. Because he's at my right hand, I will never be shaken Right hand was the place of vulnerability for a warrior. If you're striking out at someone, you're vulnerable. If 
for attack over here. So whoever's on your right hand is your, your shield and your protector. David feels secure. And so can we. Make him your Lord. Delight in his people. Rest in his providence. Receive his instruction. There's a final way that David makes God his refuge. Rejoice in his resurrection. Verses 9 to 11. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David began by praying for preservation. He's in a crisis or he's anticipating one. He ends here with a whole lot of joy, doesn't he? My heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh dwells secure. This is the great power of prayer, of going to God with our burdens. This is where making God your refuge will lead you. I wonder if you struggle with joy. I certainly do. Melancholy can come any time. Well, friend, we ought to walk in joy because we're making God our refuge. If depression is a stubborn darkness, we ought to stubbornly pursue joy in the midst of that darkness. These final words speak of a, a confidence stretching all the way to death and beyond. That's what he's talking about. When he wrote this psalm, he, he's trusting that he himself will be preserved as long as the lifespan is that God has measured out for him. Beyond that, he says that God has made known to him the path of life, meaning that God has graciously revealed to him the path of salvation. He, he knows God and is forgiven of his sin by God. That leads to an eternal home. In your presence, there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. That's the single best description of heaven that I've found anywhere in the Bible. Uh, preachers are always saying stuff like that. I, I preached on um, Matthew 25 a few weeks ago uh, where Jesus says, enter into the joy of your master. I said, that's the best description of heaven I know. I think this one is better. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, our pleasures forevermore. When David writes this psalm, he's, take, he's talking about his own situation while also looking towards something and someone greater. You know, when the book of Acts records the sermons, the early sermons both of Peter and Paul as they go out preaching the gospel, they each argue from Psalm 16.10 when David says, you will not let your Holy One see corruption, or another way to translate it is, you will not let your Holy One see decay, that he can't just be talking about himself. So listen to Peter in Acts 2.29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. I find that passage amazing. Peter says that David looks down through history with spirit-inspired prophetic ability and sees the fact that God's promise to him that he'd always have a descendant on the throne means that one of his future offspring would be the Messiah and rise from the dead. And that's what Jesus did. He was killed on the cross where we believe that God the Father poured out on him all the wrath against all the sin of everyone who would ever repent and believe in him. And then, though they put him in a tomb in the rock, his body didn't stay there long enough to begin rotting. It didn't rot. Instead, it was given new life. And so he rose from the dead. He then appeared to Peter and James and John and all the disciples 
who then went out and started telling people. That's why we're here today, because they told someone who told someone who told someone who told Eric who told me, and someone told you. Paul argues the exact same way in his first missionary journey. First sermon, quotes Psalm 16. And then he says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is why I can proclaim to you forgiveness of sins this morning. Do you have sins in need of forgiveness? We all do. Your sin is a slavery that you need to be freed from. You can't be freed from it by trying to keep the law, by trying to be a good person. You need the forgiveness that comes from trusting in Jesus. Everyone who believes is freed. So do you believe this morning? This is the final and essential thing you need to do if you're going to make God your refuge. You can put him first and make him your Lord. You can delight in his people and rest in his providence. You can receive his instruction. But if you're going to be set free from what the writer of Hebrews calls a slavery to the fear of death, then you've got to grab with both hands the truth of the resurrection. I wonder if you've thought about the fact that that's why we're here on Sunday morning. Too many churches have too easily given up on meeting on Sunday morning. It isn't just that it's a convenient day to meet. The early Christians met on Sunday and called it the Lord's Day because it was the day Jesus rose from the dead. It was the day that Mary went to the tomb with the embalming plan to try to delay the decay that she assumed was already causing his body to smell and to rot. Instead, she sees the angel who says, why do you look for the living among the dead? She tells Peter and John who run to the tomb, there's nothing there, it's empty. They can't believe it because they know that dead people stay dead. So so when you get out of bed and you drag your weary body to church here on Sunday morning, you're proclaiming that you believe that too. You believe in the resurrection of the dead. You believe that though sometime in between now and a hundred years from now, every one of us will draw our final breath, the last one, and we will die. Some of us, it will be very soon. Likely a doctor will proclaim us dead. Some paperwork will be written up. Some kind of service will be held. Some kind of words will be said. And many will think, well, that's the end of her. He was was a good man, wasn't he? But now he's gone. What a pity. And they will be wrong if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because somewhere on the other side of that final breath, there will be the sound of a trumpet and a great shout, and the dead in Christ will rise, and new breath will come into your lungs. That, friends, is why we're here this week and every week, to read, to pray, sing about that. We sang that song earlier, Hark I Hear the Harps Eternal. It speaks about the saints who have gone before us, singing on the other side of the river of death. Some have crossed before us safely to that land of perfect rest. Can you hear them singing faintly in the mansions of the blessed? You might think of saints of this very church who lived and died trusting in the risen Christ. I wonder if you can hear them singing faintly this morning. 
We can certainly hear David singing. He's singing this psalm to us. Preserve us, O God, for in you I take refuge. You are our Lord. Your saints are our delight. Your providence is our rest. Your word is our counsel. Your resurrection is our hope. That, friends, is our secure refuge, which leads to eternal joy. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you because we have nowhere else to go. We come to you for refuge amidst the storms of life and pray that you would keep us safe. And we have great confidence because of what Jesus did. I pray that you would give us faith and trust this morning and that you would give us joy. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.